This is my favorite story of King David. Um, it's a story of joy, and it's a story of uh, religion and joy, that religion is about joy. Uh, I think if for any reason, if for any reason Israel fell in love with David, this was it. Um, he shows joy. Now, before I get into joy, I want to say a, a couple things about the Second Samuel reading. I think the Second Samuel reading begins not with joy. It begins with, it's a political demonstration. It's David's effort to further legitimize and consolidate his power. It's a, it's a further effort to convince the people that he is the rightful king and rightfully God's chosen person. So a lot of this is orchestrated. A lot of this is, is following a script. Um, the, one of the best ways David can, can consolidate his power and legitimize his power is to say that God is on his side. And so that's the importance of bringing the ark of God into Jerusalem in this procession. It's David saying, God is on my side. Now the ark, you know, we know about the ark from Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? We know, we know what's in it and all of that and what it does. Um, there they're really not quite sure what was in the Ark of, uh, of God. Um, it was a box that they carried around. Um, it could be the tablets of the Ten Commandments. It could have been uh, Aaron's staff that blossomed when he stuck it in the ground. It could have been a pot of manna that was saved from the, when they journeyed in the wilderness. And it could be a book of the law. Or it could be all of it. Uh, it would be like um, the new president bringing in the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and saying, now that I, I have these, this proves that I'm a rightful president. Uh, so that, it's a political demonstration. And, and you know, with political demonstrations, uh, they're scripted, they go by the book, they have planners that, that do it for quite a while. Um, and it's a way to almost, you know, manipulate the people into believing everything is legitimate. Um, I was once part of a, of, I guess you'd call it a demonstration, and on the, on the schedule was um, at 7.16, we would have a spontaneous demonstration. Uh, oh, I'm glad you laughed at that. I, I thought it was kind of funny myself. You know, um, it, it's all scripted. And then at some point uh, in this procession to Jerusalem with the Ark of God, Something happens to David, and it's no longer um, scripted. He, he gets actually full of the Spirit, and he goes off script. He goes off the page, and he starts dancing and singing, and the people pick up on that cue, and they start dancing and singing. And what was kind of a political obligation, which was a, what, uh, what was originally a duty that people had to do, becomes joy that they want to do. Um, the politics become joy, and the religion becomes joy. It's kind of hard in my mind to think of politics as joy. It's just as hard to think about religion as joy. We tend to think of religion more as duty, as obligation, as what we should do and what we shouldn't do and what we ought not do, um, we don't think of religion as joy. Uh, you know, we, we open every service with a prayer at, at 11 o'clock, and Colleen might write her own. Uh, I, I get my prayers for our services from books. So this week, I went looking from the, through the books for a prayer on joy, and I couldn't find one. I found a lot about discipleship, about service, about duty, about obligation, about, oh, Lord, make us more like Christ so we can serve you more fully and love our neighbor for, more fully. But there was nothing really about joy. So what we did for our prayer was, we prayed the first verse of hymn 617, I come with joy. You know, I come with joy to meet our Lord, forgiven, loved, and, and freed. Well, that's kind of joy. 
and in such joy and wonder to receive. You know, that's joy. But it was hard to find a, a prayer on joy. And it's interesting to me that when we think of religion, we don't think of joy very often. Although Jesus, at the, at the Last Supper, says, um, I've said these things and done these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. I mean, the whole point of Jesus is joy. So, what is joy? Well, it's not the same as happiness. Most of us know joy and happiness are not the same thing. Happiness has to do with external things. Um, if it's a sunny day, I'm happy. If, um, if the attendance is good and the offering is good, I'm happy. Yeah, make me happy. And, uh, you know, um, if I got that job offer, I'm happy. If I don't, I'm not happy. It has to do with what happens to me around me. So my life is kind of controlled by other things. Joy is an internal experience. It's kind of not only because of, but it's in spite of certain things. I'm joyful. I just have this, this feeling within me. Now, as I started to think about this, about joy and preaching on joy, I started to think of examples of joy and ask people for examples of joy. And, you know, it's hard to come up with examples of joy. We, we don't really think that way. We don't, uh, we don't have many joyful experiences. When I ask people, on the other hand, can you give me some examples of sadness or sorrow or suffering? Oh, yeah. They could talk a lot about that in their life. But joy was kind of a rare experience. I would define joy as the experience of being loved unconditionally. The experience of being loved unconditionally. Uh, Gwen talked about it very well to the children. That's, that's joy. Yeah. John Wesley, you know, kind of the foundation story of Methodism is John Wesley's heart being strangely warmed. What he, you know, what happened there what strangely warmed his heart was the experience that, as he says in his journal, God loved me, even me. He had this experience of being loved unconditionally. And I would say that's joy. Two weeks ago, um, I urged, at the end of the sermon, urged you uh, to go see the Mr. Rogers documentary. And one of you listened to me, and that Sunday afternoon went to the theater to see the Dr. Mr. Rogers documentary. And on Monday, this person sent me an email and said, you know, I did as you told me to do, and I went and saw the movie, and it affected me much more than I anticipated it would affect me. I've always, and it went on to say, I've always felt that the main purpose in life is to love and to be loved. And he said, I, I think I do loving pretty well. I'm, I'm generous. I, I think of others. I'm generous with my money and my time. But I don't receive love. I don't feel loved. I don't feel worthy. And the person said, you know, that scene in the movie where this person says to Mr. Rogers, you really love me. And Mr. Rogers says, yeah, I've been telling you that for the last three years. And this person said, I never get that. I never hear that. And he wrote and said, am I odd? Is there anybody else like me? And I wrote back and said, I think everybody's like you. I think we all kind of know how to give love, 
but it's that receiving it that's hard. When we experience that unconditional love, when we experience that joy, you know, it does free us. We don't feel like we have to earn love. We don't feel like we have to please people. We can just receive love and express ourselves. Um, you know, when we have that experience of unconditional love and joy, um, well, joy is, is sometimes called ecstasy. And if you break the word ecstasy down to its root, it's out of static, out of stationary. It means to be joyful is to be out of the rut, you know, out of things as they always are. It kind of shocks us into life and new life. And to be out of the stationary not only um, gets us out of the rut, it also kind of roots us so that we're grounded in, um, in unconditional love and see our lives differently. And, and joy, you know, connects us to other people. And joy makes us, doesn't make us stingy, it makes us generous. And we want to share that unconditional love with others. And I think that's what's going on with David here. Um, you know, he, he has this experience of God loves me unconditionally. And he's, and he's dancing and he's, he's happy and, and he's joyful and he, he shares. He shares that with others and includes the whole city in it. So how do we get joy? How do we plug into joy? It sounds really good. You know, well, it's not something we plug into. Joy is not something we get or take. I was thinking of almost everything in the world I can get or I can acquire. You know, I, I can acquire new clothes. I can acquire a car. I can, I can you know, get food. But joy, like forgiveness and like grace, isn't something we can get. It's only something we can receive. And that might be the first trick for joy, is to realize we can only receive it. So we have to open ourselves up. Joy isn't something we can manipulate or control. And it doesn't have to do with the circumstances around us. Joy happens. When C.S. Lewis wrote his book on his conversion, his experience of God's unconditional love, he titled the book, Surprised by Joy. And joy always comes to us as a surprise because we're not expecting it. And I also think with joy, we're looking for big stuff. And often it's little stuff. And often with joy, it has to do with how we receive it. it, has to do with the kind of people we are. For some of us, it can be dramatic, and for others, it can be very quiet. Last, um, last summer, I started to walk to, I needed to get my steps in, so I, I went to, I walked to the um, fifth third bank that's at high and 18th or 19th up there. And it was, it was threatening, the weather was threatening, and I took my little tote umbrella, and by the time I'd gotten to the fa uh, faculty club, drops of rain the size of small cats were falling around <laughs> me. And I thought, I'm not going to make it. And I put up my umbrella, and it really started to pour. And it just was coming down in sheets. And, you know, the umbrella wasn't doing much good. I, you know, my, uh, from, from my knees down, I was just soaked. My back, of, my back was soaked. My T-shirt was clinging to me. 
and there were rivers forming going across the oval and College Drive was a river and High Street was a river and I you know I thought oh I've got to keep dry and so I was tiptoeing you know <laughs> through the islands of dryness and I just kept getting wetter and wetter and finally I just gave in to it and I thought John quit fighting this enjoy it and I had the best time <laughs> splashing through water and getting wet and, you know, I didn't care that I had to wait at High Street to cross the street. You can't get any wetter. And I thought, I haven't had this much fun since I was a kid. You know, and it was just surprised by joy of feeling so connected and uh, so much a part of the world around me. And, and I'm sure I shared that infectious joy with the people around me who thought I was nuts. You know, and I walked into Fifth Third, and Chris, the teller, said, Oh, John, you look awful. And I said, I feel great. <laughs> yeah. I never thought I'd be surprised by joy walking across the oval in a downpour. When saints write about joy, they often talk about experiencing joy in the midst of sorrow in the midst of sadness? I, was, I never understood that, but I've started to understand what they mean is when our defenses are down, which is often the case in the midst of sorrow and grief, we are open to receive God's unconditional love. There's nothing blocking it. And so when we're grieving or when we're sorrowful, we can experience God's unconditional love. Frequently at deathbeds, I experience joy because I'm experiencing God's unconditional love. Yeah. When we were talking in sermon starters about God's unconditional love and joy, two people said, you know, I didn't understand love until my child was born and I held my child for the first time and I realized that I loved this child unconditionally and I felt such joy in that unconditional love. And I thought, I wonder if that's how it is with God that when we're born, God holds us and feels joy at our birth. That God has this unconditional love for us and has joy in our existence. <clears throat> My son's birthday is today. And as I do uh, for every birthday with our kids, I send them a text as early as I can. <laughs> I gotta beat Susan. <laughs> so I sent Nick a text and just said, happy birthday, I'm glad you're here. Not, I'm glad you have a job, I'm glad you have health insurance, I'm just glad you're here. You know, that's unconditional love. Last Sunday, Colleen talked about um, the Methodist preacher, Zan Holmes. Well, I have a Zan Holmes story to tell, too. When he, um, he said when he was growing up, when he was in high school, and he'd go out uh, on the night, uh, uh, for the night with his buddies, his mother would never say, now don't drink, now don't don't go to wild parties. Don't drive wildly. She never laid down the do's and don'ts, the obligations and the duties of how he should be a responsible teenager. He said all his mother said to him was, Zan, remember who you are. Remember who you are. Remember that you are loved unconditionally 
by God. That's what happened to David. And that's our joy. Remember, you are loved by God unconditionally. And sometime that's going to take you by surprise and you're going to hear it for the first time. Oh, God loves me unconditionally. Whoa, I never knew that. And now you do. And it's a joy that lasts a lifetime. May it be so.